Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Some Southern Indiana residents are coming to grips with the reality that they have HIV. She, she just looked me point blank in the eye and said, you want to live or die? More than six months after the HIV epidemic began in Scott County, health officials say it's on a downward trend and other counties are taking steps to prevent their own epidemics. And as baby boomers retire, will millennials be able to take their place? If you think about the classic example, Kodak had thousands of employees when, when they went bankrupt, and Instagram, when they were bought for a billion dollars, had 13. In our series on re-entering the workforce, we explore why young people are finding it harder to get jobs than some might think. Those stories and a look at this week's top stories from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The HIV outbreak in southeastern Indiana has reached its peak and is now on a downward trend. In the past month, only four new cases have been diagnosed, bringing the total number of infected people to 174. Most of those cases have been traced back to Scott County, but that's not stopping other communities from taking action. As Barbara Brozier reports, as residents of Scott County learn to cope with the aftermath of the epidemic, the list of counties considering implementing needle exchange programs to prevent the spread of HIV in their communities keeps growing. And from here all the way down. The marks on Kevin Polly's arms are a reminder of where he's been. That's a scar from a miss that I, uh, had, I had to go to the hospital. And just how far he's come. At the end, that's the only place I would hit was in my neck. Most of Polly's life has revolved around addiction. He was living in the small rural community of Austin, shooting up a prescription painkiller called Opana four to five times a day. With no jobs, no money, nothing else to do, it's how a lot of people in Austin were spending their time. I was to the point that's all I cared about. From the time I was awake till the time I went to bed, I was either using or trying to find something to use. That vicious cycle came to a screeching halt a few months ago when an HIV outbreak hit southeastern Indiana. With so many IV drug users sharing needles, Austin was ground zero. I got a letter in the mail in, uh, I believe it was February, saying that uh, it come from the Clark County Health Department, uh, stating that someone had test tested positive, positive for a communicable disease and turned my name in. Polly went to the health department to have a mouth swab done. The test came back positive. I was devastating. Uh, at the time, I thought that was, my life was over. Turns out, it wasn't. Very last thing I did before I left my house, one last time, shot up in Opana. And, that, and that's been the last time, April the 17th. Polly checked himself into treatment in Jeffersonville, made it through the 35-day program, and is now living in a halfway house. Feels good. I mean, uh, I'm, I just celebrated 90 days clean and sober. I didn't think I'd celebrate nine days clean and sober. And things are looking up back home, too. We have them come through here. We offer the same things that we offered at the other place. The Scott County Health Department is settling into a new satellite office in the middle of the neighborhood hit hardest by the outbreak. Here they offer immunizations, HIV testing, insurance sign up, and the needle exchange program. They're really wanting the sterile water a lot. That's what Oscar asked for extra for because um, they a lot of them don't even have running water. In the few weeks it's been open, this has become a popular place. We're here outside of normal business hours, but with the health department car parked out front, people keep stopping by for fresh needles. You don't want them in the bag? The needle exchange has connected the county health department to a population that's been underserved in this community. When they come in to get needles, they show the nurse an unusual bump or tell her about breathing trouble. And many of those people are finally getting help. There's a lot of people that never would have signed up on insurance 
that we signed up on insurance that can now go to the doctor because they have insurance and they have that coverage. While the outlook for this community was not good when the outbreak started, there's a renewed sense of hope on the streets. It seems the small town that felt left behind is now serving as a model for other communities throughout the state. We've got in contact with several counties. Some have come and actually toured the program and see how we ran it and things like that. Several other counties have already sought approval for needle exchange programs or are considering doing so. An exchange in Madison County will go into effect in August. Fayette County has also requested an exchange. But it's unclear how the state will judge the success of the programs. Indiana State Department of Health is working very closely with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to develop measures that uh, to use to evaluate the needle exchange programs uh, to identify data points and a way to track data over time. Clark County will hold a hearing next week to see what the public thinks about starting an exchange here, where the hepatitis C and HIV rates are 25 to 30 percent higher than the state average. That's worrisome to Kevin Polly, who's seen firsthand how quickly the disease can spread. He wants to settle down in Clark County, and he doesn't want to be living in another community consumed by an outbreak. A year from now, I hope to have my own place here in Jeffersonville. Uh, there's just so there's so much more to offer here. Good job with that story, Barbara. And we heard from Kevin Polly, who's been successful in rehab. Are others getting that same treatment? Well, you know, Joe, they are being connected to mental health and drug addiction treatment, but the Scott County Health Department doesn't know numbers on quite how many people are actually getting that treatment and sticking with it. Those who do seek out treatment, though, they have to travel to the Indianapolis area or down almost all the way to Louisville, to Jeffersonville, to get into those residential treatment programs. The good news, though, is that Lifespan Mental Health Services, they're going to move into that building that the Scott County Health Department has recently moved into. So they'll be right in the heart of the outbreak, and people will have more access to some of those services. You know, when you talk to people that have an addiction, it, it, they really have to make that choice mm -hmm. to, to stop it. What, what made him decide to stop and well, get treatment? For Kevin, it was really that HIV diagnosis. It was the worst kind of wake-up call he could have gotten, but he got that diagnosis and then he decided, hey, I'm going to go through treatment. He had a nine-day span where he was still using drugs before he went through with that. He said it was really hard when he first got to the program, but he has had no urge since then to use again, which and, is incredible. And Polly is a big propon a proponent of the needle exchange program. How do other counties going to go about to fund that? Well, uh, this law that allows counties to have the needle exchange programs, it does not have any federal or state funding tied to it. So they're trying to figure out how they can work with community partners, nonprofit organizations, and the CDC has been helpful, at least in Scott County, with helping connect them to organizations that will donate the actual needles that they can hand out. Now, if we see more of these exchanges being implemented throughout the state, could legislation change at all? Well, state legislators were pretty clear when they passed this very limited program where you have to have a public health emergency. It has to be approved by the state before you can start the program. They made it clear that's all they want. They don't want a statewide program because they don't want to encourage drug users to continue using. So they think this is the best plan of attack for right now. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara, for that report. And now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. Health insurer Anthem is buying rival Cigna for $48 billion. The deal will make Anthem the country's largest health insurer, covering 53 million people. Cigna rejected several of Anthem's earlier offers, but Cigna's top officials say they're looking forward to the opportunities the acquisition presents. Anthem CEO says he believes the deal will allow the company to expand its services. Analysts, though, warn it could increase prices for consumers as competition drops in the health insurance marketplace. The deal is expected to be finalized in the second half of 2016. A southern Indiana woman has filed a lawsuit alleging her religious beliefs were infringed when she was fired from her job for refusing to process marriage applications for same-sex couples. Linda Summers was terminated from her job at the Harrison County Clerk's Office in December after she says she was authored and delivered a letter requesting an accommodation for her sincerely held religious beliefs. Court documents say Summers, who had been employed at the office since 2008, quote, 
felt that being required to process marriage licenses for same-sex couples violated her religious beliefs based upon biblical teaching. Summer's complaint alleges there were two other employees in the clerk's office who were willing to process same-sex marriage applications so she wouldn't have to. The U.S. Veterans Affairs Secretary says his department is making progress in rebuilding trust lost in last year's scandal involving manipulated wait times and falsified waiting lists. As Brandon Smith reports, in a visit to Indiana Thursday, Bob McDonnell pointed to the Indianapolis facility as a, as a leader in what he calls the VA's transformation. After touring the Raudabush Veterans Affairs Medical Center, Secretary McDonald said he's confident Congress will deliver funding flexibility to help the VA address those growing needs. He says the VA has reduced the disabilities claims backlog by 80 percent in the last couple of years and is now focusing on increasing access to primary care. But obviously we still have uh, more work to do. We know that across the nation, uh, trust has been compromised in the VA last year and we're working hard to earn it back one veteran at a time. Indianapolis VA officials note that adding one primary care team, which includes a doctor, a nurse, and clerical staff, can allow the VA to treat 1,200 more Hoosier veterans. The Indiana State Fair is asking its vendors not to sell Confederate flags at this year's fair. The move comes after a shooting in South Carolina sparked debate over the meaning of the flag. An Indiana State Fairgrounds spokesperson says the State Fair Commission has a long-standing policy with its vendors that prohibits offensive items and expects all its vendors will comply with the request. The Indiana National Guard is training some of its members to serve as additional security at its recruiting facilities across the state. The Armed Force Protection Officers, as they are called, will be issued military weapons. And that's in addition to the new policy that allows National Guard members to carry their personal firearms at National Guard facilities. Yeah, and we're, for security reasons, we're not going to get into exactly where and specifically what locations uh, have the armed personnel. Uh, there, there, we have armed personnel at locations across the state of Indiana to include our 62 installations, to include our air wings, uh, and, to, and to also include our 12 recruiting storefronts across the state of Indiana. Governor Mike Pence ordered the new policy be put into place after a shooting in Chattanooga, Tennessee killed five service members. Well, it could be years before the man convicted of bombing the Boston Marathon is brought to the Federal Correctional Complex in Terre Haute to be executed. Johar Sarnayev was moved earlier this week to a maximum security penitentiary in Colorado that houses male inmates who are deemed the most dangerous. If Sarnayev's death sentence is carried out, it will be done in Terre Haute, which is the home to the only federal prison with an execution chamber. But experts say his appeals process will likely take years. Indiana is losing ground compared to other states when it comes to children's overall well-being. Data from the Annie E. Casey's Foundation's Kid Count report shows Indiana ranks 32nd in overall child well-being. That's a drop from 27th last year. According to the study, 22% of children in the Hoosier state live in poverty, with 12% in high poverty areas. One area of significant improvement, though, is the percentage of babies born with a low birth weight. After several years performing worse than most other states, Indiana is now below the national average at 7.9%. The Indiana Attorney General is officially launching his bid for Indiana's 9th District Congressional seat. Greg Zeller announced his campaign before a crowd in Jeffersonville earlier this week. He says his time spent as the Attorney General qualifies him for national office. I don't really crave the applause and I'm not interested in posturing. I'm used to the unglamorous hard work of fighting every day to make a difference. That's what I've done as your Attorney General and that's why today I'm announcing that I'll seek election as the next congressman from the 9th District. Zeller joins a GOP primary race that also features State Senators Brent Waltz and Aaron Houchin and grassroots conservative leader Robert Hall. The Cook Group is bringing its biopharmaceutical business to Monroe County. Cook announced this week it will invest $28 million to renovate and equip its facility in Bloomington. The company is receiving up to $675,000 in tax credits and grants to complete the expansion, which is expected to create up to 70 new jobs by the year 2020. 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to determine the best way to accommodate new wind energy projects while also protecting endangered birds and bats that might be killed by running into turbines. Casey Kuhn reports on a public hearing held this week. Members of the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service came to a public meeting Wednesday evening to explain the Midwest Wind Energy Multi-Species Habitat Conservation Plan. It looks at eight different states, including Indiana, to establish a new protocol for companies to receive permits that allow them to accidentally kill, or take as it's called, a certain number of endangered animals each year. It's a benefit to the industry that they can come in and, and get take coverage but it's also a benefit to the states and the service because we're, you know, obviously one of the idea, you know, outcomes of this is to reduce, you know, take at these facilities. Right now, wind energy companies work with the Fish and Wildlife Service on a project by project basis, creating their own permits, allowing for a certain take of these endangered species. The new conservation plan would create a universal permit companies can apply for if they follow a few guidelines including covering construction and operation of commercial wind turbines, managing impact in covered areas, and monitoring the turbine site. Currently, there are more than 1,000 turbines on six wind farms in Indiana. And Department of Natural Resource officials say they're trying to trap a bear that has wandered into the northern part of Indiana. This is the first black bear seen in the state in more than 140 years. It was first spotted last month, and since then it's been getting bolder. Residents in the area say it's been getting into their trash and even pawing at doors and windows. So Joe, DNR officials say if the bear can't be trapped easily, they might have to tranquilize it and then send it back to Michigan where it came from. That is not something you want to see in your backyard. Sounds like a very nosy bear. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. What does it take to get a job right out of college? The answer to that question seems to be constantly changing. As companies reinvent themselves, potential employees are being asked to do the same. And as Congress debates whether to overhaul No Child Left Behind, Indiana is being exempt from the education standards for another three years. Our state impact team explains the potential impact in the classroom. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The fact that PBS is the most trusted media outlet in the country means a great deal to me. We live now in the most multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic America ever. There are a lot of voices in this country that need to be heard. I think that my job is to help Americans re-examine the assumptions that they hold, to expand their inventory of ideas, and hopefully to introduce Americans to each other. And we take that challenge seriously every day. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The Indiana Department of Education received good news from the federal government this week. Its No Child Left Behind waiver is being extended three years, the longest extension in the state's history. To explain what this extension means for Indiana schools, Claire McInerney of our state impact education team joins us. Hi, Claire. Hi, Joe. First, the No Child Left Behind is a set of academic standards that was set by the Bush administration. So what does this mean that now there's waivers? Sure, so as a reminder, No Child Left Behind was the law that kind of enacted our current assessment system, so it requires that we test students in reading and math every year, um, and it was in the hopes to get 100% um, proficiency by last year. As we got closer to the proficiency deadline, the government realized that most students weren't gonna make that, so they created these waivers where states could create their own proficiency standards and make sure they met them. Um, the waiver allows us to continue doing that, and you know some of the benefits of the waiver is we get to use federal education funds in the way we want and we get to address failing schools in the way we want. Um, last year we almost lost our waiver when we switched from Common Core to our own standards so I think it was probably a relief definitely over at the Department of Education that we didn't have to deal with that again. But Congress is currently looking to change 
the No Child Left Behind? Sure. So they, yeah, they have been working for months on a rewrite of No Child Left Behind. Um, one of the main things I think they're trying to do is uh, get rid of such strict testing requirements. Um, so if they come to a conclusion soon, we'll have a brand new law and we might have to seek another waiver to be exempt from the new law. Now, before you go, let's quickly get an update on the allegations that Superintendent Ritz uh, violated her campaign finance laws uh, with her gubernatorial campaign. But the Indiana Election Division met this week, and what did they come up with? Well, they actually didn't even address the Ritz stuff. They say that they don't launch a formal investigation into something like that until they get a formal complaint, and they haven't gotten that yet. Um, but as background, last week some financial documents about Ritz's gubernatorial campaign came to light saying that she had accepted donations during the legislative session, which is illegal. Um, later in the week, she did say that the date on those documents were a mistake and that she resubmitted some amended documents. Um, but uh, as a result of that, she did publicly name a treasurer to her mm -hmm. campaign. So, you know, hopefully nothing like that going forward. But All right. Thank you very much, Claire. Yes, Appreciate thank it. You, Joe. The workplace is changing at a rapid pace. Employees have to learn how to use new technology every day. Jobs can often be more short-term and project-oriented. And companies are looking for people who not only have the skills to fill today's positions, but are able to think ahead and shape how business is done in the future. Those factors present a challenge for students just graduating from college and looking for jobs. But as Gretchen Frazee reports in part two of our series on entering the workforce, it can also present enormous opportunities for those in the millennial generation. When Mitch Innes first thought about coming to Indiana University, it was in hopes of studying classical piano at the world-renowned Jacobs School of Music. It's something that I've really kind of loved to do all my life, um, but, you know, I think freshman, sophomore year, kind of sat down with my parents and, and piano teacher and kind of figured, um, you know, maybe business in some sort of capacity was more appropriate. I think I have kind of an aptitude for math. Going into business would provide more security and likely more money. So after he graduated high school, Ennis entered IU's Kelly School of Business. I got involved um, pretty early. I actually joined a professional business fraternity my second semester. And for me, I'd really kind of say that was the turning point in kind of my professional development. Ennis decided he wanted to be an investment banker and it's paid off. After graduating this spring, Ennis headed to the big city, New York, to work for J.P. Morgan. You know, it's funny, we just often think about when he was younger and he'd wear his hat sideways and he was into skateboarding and we were really worried, was he going to accomplish anything and we couldn't be prouder of what he's done. Ennis' success is a combination of his skill, determination and economics. Why is hiring increased with the uh, college, you know, entry level. And I think the biggest, a big reason, I would say a big reason is that the baby boomers, there's going to be an exodus of baby boomers. Um, and so organizations are going to try to ramp up their current talent pool because a group is leaving. This year, millennials became the largest share of the labor force, outpacing baby boomers. They now account for more than one out of every three workers. But that doesn't necessarily mean all millennials are getting good jobs. In fact, 15% of 18 to 29 year olds are unemployed, about three times the national average. The reality is that the top one third of millennials are actually doing fairly well. They're getting high paying jobs, they're paying off their student debt, they're, they're buying houses, they're doing all of those typical things. It's the bottom two thirds that are really having a challenge connecting with the job market as it exists now. Jonathan Hewer wrote a book and created an app to help students enter and stay in the workforce. He says even with many baby boomers retiring, the job market is still tough for millennials. If you think about the classic example, Kodak had thousands of employees when, when they went bankrupt, and Instagram, when they were bought for a billion dollars, had 13. So there's a, there's a much smaller number of people required to impact a much, much larger area. So the question is, is it going to be a one-to-one -one replacement? One boomer retires, one millennial comes in. I, I don't think so at all. That's why Hewer says millennials looking for jobs have to be innovators. He says the ingredients are already there because they're used to living in a changing world, particularly when it comes to technology. At some level, it's pretty basic. We want critical thinkers. We want students that can learn. And we want um, students that are really self-disciplined and self-motivated. Hewer says schools also need to do a better job preparing their students for careers. Most colleges have career services centers, but they aren't mandated as a part of students' curricula. So few students take advantage of the free help. 
Mitch Ennis says he felt like he got that kind of training, but he says he recognizes students in other majors or at other schools often don't get that kind of exposure. I'm just, um, you know, really thankful and, and, and life honestly is pretty good. And he says being an investment banker doesn't mean he'll have to give up his love for music either. He plans to keep playing the piano as a way to relax from what he expects to be long, grueling days in the financial world. Issues surrounding millennials' employment are likely to be amplified in the coming years. Millennials are expected to make up 46% of the labor force by 2020. 25 years ago this Sunday, the Americans with Disabilities Act went into effect, preventing discrimination based on disability. One company in Indianapolis has been working to connect people with disabilities to employers to help them build long-term careers. What we've seen since the ADA has been passed is that those accessibility uh, steps that we've made have been beneficial for the public at large. And so um, there's really been, I think, uh, a lot more acceptance of that within the general public. But now it's kind of fine-tuning it and tweaking it. I think we've gotten kind of past the it's necessary, but now we're in kind of the how do you do it and how does it apply to specific situations. You can create Tangrim has matched more than two dozen people with jobs since it began the program in 2013. And that's the end of this program. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you.